Welcome to Expedient Means with Lin Wei on Time Monk Radio. Lin currently resides in China and is the founder and head teacher of Guizhen Philocultural Society. He has extensive experience in Buddhist and Taoist meditation, Qigong, martial arts, and traditional Chinese medicine. To learn more about Lin, please visit his website at www.guizhenhui.net. Tonight, Lin will be discussing Unplugged. Welcome back, Lin. Hello, hello. Uh, I didn't hear you for a second. I thought you might have been unplugged. <laughs> wah, 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 wah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, being unplugged. Um, what exactly are we referring to? Hmm, interesting. Now, when I hear this title, I think of The Matrix and taking my... Uh, my brain or my nervous system out of a big machine. <laughs> well, we're not talking about that. <clears throat> what we're talking about here, unplugged, means what we put in our mind, what we put in all our views, our emotions, all that stuff, which shape our whole entire experience of the life we have. And ripping it out. <laughs> that's unplugged see the Buddha made a, made, made his um, teachings and his teachings were we don't experience reality uh, fully because we are stuck in our senses we are stuck within our senses our nervous system our body, our five senses and then our mind, our sixth sense kind of are obstructing the true experience of things so today unplugged is that. We if are you take getting away, out of that. If you take away all those things and there's nothing left to experience, right? Get rid of them first and see. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can tell you, I'm not going to add in more thoughts about it because then it just leaves us to intellectualize. And then what are you left with? More intellectualization, more of experiencing what we assume uh, based on our mind, our thoughts. And then... Whatever experience we have with our senses, our other five senses, then, you know, it's not going to be true still. You can get the truth and tell it to somebody, and they will just take a portion of it and see which one is fit for them, and they would reshape their whole entire outlook based on that one small portion of the truth that you gave them, when actually it's a much bigger picture, but they are still stuck within their senses. So... <clears throat> How do we do this? How do we go and unplug ourselves from the reality which we have given ourselves? And when I say given, means <laughs> the LSD. <laughs> <laughs> um, basically, it's we've given ourselves our experience of the world based on the way the world or the way things are done by other people around us. And we accept it. We accept it to be normal. This is the way society is. This is what we're going to do. And we'll build up our views based on those things. Okay, we do need to meditate. To go inside and look, search, reflect, and ask ourselves many, 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 many questions about this. Why is it this way? When did this happen? How did I allow this? Why did I believe I needed to allow it? What influenced me to think that this was the right way? Uh, what other views are there that tell me it's not the right way? And go deep into that. This is really a surgery we're doing <laughs> in the mind. We want to reach the mind ground and clear out these obstructions. I just had a and, weird thought. Uh-oh. <laughs> I don't know. Tell me what you think about it. But anyway, it's just, just sort of popped into my head but so is meditation being unplugged or is meditation being plugged in ha ha, 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 ha. it's like the cup half full thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> pretty much <clears throat> think of it more like there is an in and an out and then there is no in and no out and when in meditation or when in in the practice to reach meditation because when we're doing the meditation getting into the state that says we're getting it we are in meditation when you're not moved you hit meditation now the work begins before we were just trying to toil and nourish and cultivate once we hit the state now we're in 
meditation. So whether it's in or out, let's not look at it that way. Let's look at it as when you are doing your meditation, you are seeing what has been added and what has been left. And then we want to get all of it out. I'm Hello? turning that over. I'm turning that over in my mind. <laughs> <laughs> get it all out. You see, in meditation, we are uh, subject to our emotions. We're subject to our views. We're subject to our memories, feelings, uh, physical sensations, emotional sensations. Uh, you're subject to your body like in any other time of the day outside of just the sitting of practice or any practice that requires the concentration. And while we're at the mercy of these things, we are feeding these things our attention. We're feeding it our views and we're creating more views about them. So they obstruct us. We don't really know the true world. People think they know the true world, um, but we don't because we're stuck around the world of our senses. And it's a very, very uh, intense, uh, quote-unquote, battle. Okay, because think of being a fish out of water and you're flapping around all over the place trying to gasp for air, and then all of a sudden it, you stop. There's nothing to grasp for anymore. It's over. We want to get to that point, but without actually losing our physical body, and we do that through meditation. That allows us to gasp and gasp and grasp and grasp for that last breath. And then all of a sudden we hit the threshold and boom, we're stuck. We're stuck where? We're stuck in nothing because there's no vo uh, views. There's no thoughts at that point because it'll come to its own end. There's nothing feeding the momentum anymore. It's over with. Now sure. we get to do the real work. Traditionally, when we say unplug, though, I guess, especially, well, primarily in modern society, it's probably a more modern term even. But, um, you know, people associate that with getting away from the computer, leaving the cell phone behind, no TV, kind of going out to a cabin and um, kind of getting in touch with nature, right? Pretty much. Um, but then still, we still take all society and all our habits that we have when we're in society with us. You know, you still have a feeling, you still have a thought about these things. You're taking them with you. It reminds me of the story about these two monks trying to cross a river. And um, there's a woman at the river and she she can't walk through the river because she's probably a little too short or she's too weak and the river currents will push her down or something. So one monk carries her on her back. When they get to the other side, he puts the woman down, wishes her well, and the two monks get, head back to the uh, to the temple. He gets a temple, and one monk says to the one who carried the woman, he says, oh, my God, you broke the, you broke the vows, you know. Uh, isn't it true that a, a monk shouldn't touch a woman? Sure. Isn't it true that we shouldn't hold them? Sure. So why did you do that? Why did you do it? He goes, well, I put her down. I left her at the end of the, the other side of the river. You're still holding her. Yeah, I love that story. <laughs> yeah, it's an awesome story. and It's like that for us. We carry all of our everything with us <laughs> so even if we left the cell phone home and we head up to the countryside for a nice two-day vacation from quote-unquote reality um we actually took all that with us because we're <clears throat> we're confirming that there is such a thing in our lives such a thing in our lives that is so powerful that we have to run away from so we're confirming that that's true and that we have to get away from it so we're con confirming that our are ignoring or are pushing aside is true and that is still false both are false those views so we want to find the origin of these views we have to reflect we have to do inner reflection investigating the origin of our views investigating where these things come from and once you find the habits of our thought and the habits of our emotion and the habits <clears throat> excuse me of our speech and lifestyle then we have to ask the, another important question. The million dollar question is, why do I still do this? <laughs> <laughs> you know, why am I doing this? Well, okay. So yes, we do still take those things with us, but, um, when you're in nature, I guess you don't have as many external distractions. So you have more time to work on these 
things you've internalized, maybe, if that makes any sense. Yes, it does. It does make sense. Yes, you don't have all these other external influences. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but you still have them in your mind. Because we never let them go. We still go back to it. But at least we have a chance to, you know, cultivate or investigate without other types of distractions, which is very important. <clears throat> so we need those things sometimes. Well, I, I guess that's why, you know, most of the monasteries, well, I don't know if most is the apt term, but um, I guess that's why so many monasteries and retreats are built up in the mountains or in the wilderness away from all those distractions, right? Right, because people are so bombarded by these distractions day by day that they don't have the skill or the concentration power uh, to just cultivate in that mess. So they have to get out of the mess in order to cultivate it. Then when they go back to the mess, they're less bothered by it, but they're still bothered by it nonetheless. Right, But at least there's that retreat, literally, to get away from the mess we create for ourselves. I was asked during a presentation at a university uh, about why is the school I have, uh, why is our meditation done in the middle of a busy avenue? <laughs> I'm like, well, that's the best meditation. Like, what are you talking about? And it was that, sure, you can have all the quietness of the beautiful mountains and the countryside and all that stuff around you. But once you go back to the city, you don't have one ounce of concentration power. Or at least you're not affected as much, but you still got affected. Why not learn to boost yourself up or, or temper yourself with everything that's around you generally in your life? Why you know, not? Using the, again, it goes back to using the distractions as expedients. Yes. And then once you get over the distraction, you can drop the expedient and move on. So we want to change our habits of our body, mouth, and mind. We want to change our views. We want to change our speech. We want to change our actions. And how well, do we do that unless we look in and okay. unplug this, literally getting out of our own cycle, jumping out of our own cycle of habits? So somebody just, just starting out, say, just beginning to practice mindfulness or meditation, would they be better off? And again, this sort of relative question, I guess, would depend on the person. But would they be better off starting in a, like a wilderness type situation, or would they be better off starting in, say, the city? Um, you got to see on the person itself. But right. I would generally say, if they're in the city, they just be in the city. If the retreat is in the city, they just be in the city. If they have the means to leave the city and go out. Then be my guest and do that too. You got to find what's comfortable for that person. Excuse me, or generally. But if it's more like uh, people who don't have the opportunity to do that, well, then you have to start up with if they're going to want to take meditation, sitting meditation as the the practice. Then you start to come on them, uh, recognizing the breath, being aware of the breath, how it moves, wherever. And then you give them an idea or a. A, uh, a phrase to, to just concentrate on but without reciting just more of being in the state of investigating and then you know you, you interrupt them a little bit you cause them to be tempered a little bit that's how we build our strength here and there I guess uh, I was just sort of thinking that say the, the wilderness type area would be more of a, a gentle way to ease into it right it would be. It's a much more appealing because you have the nice setting and everything like that, you know. And then you'll have uh, the retreats can be very expensive, and some people can't do that. So instead of traveling, you know, to the countryside or traveling to another country itself, just to find a teacher to help you on your spiritual path, why don't you just apply yourself to quiet sitting in your own house? Set up a certain time to just do that, whether it's 15 minutes or an hour. Or it doesn't matter how long. As long as you have some quiet time, you can reflect on. So you're not interrupted and you don't lose your concentration. In the beginning, we don't have concentration power. We have very little. At least 20 seconds is really hard to grasp of not thinking about what we're going to do later. You yeah, know? I, I think that's one of the traps, too, is that people think um, 
you know, I can't get it unless I'm on a mountaintop in the remote hills of Tibet because, you know, that's where the energy is highest. And, you know, there's no point <laughs> even doing anything here because it's not, you know, a, a mountain on yeah. you know, some plateau you know, in Tibet. It makes, and it makes me laugh a little uh, because even our bodies have energy centers and so does the planet. But though those certain energy centers are more concentrated and higher in vibration, it doesn't mean the rest of the place doesn't have energy. Any place can be a high vibrational place as long as you apply yourself in concentration. You apply your mind. So if my wrist is hurting, that means the energy flowing through there and the blood flowing through there and the nutrition flowing through there is not enough. So when I inhale, I'll imagine that energy moving to my wrist, to my fingertips, exhaling, it will reverse back. And then I'll inhale, let it move through and let it move back up. And then exhale, let it move through, move back up. And then I won't have any pain anymore. Oh, did I just create an energy field of, of uh, like a, a powerful energy center? Yeah, I did because I placed my focus there, my concentration there. So anywhere we go can be a high vibrating spiritual place because we never leave energy. We never I, leave energy. I've got a question for you. It's kind of maybe a little bit of a segue, <laughs> but <laughs> no, it's nothing too crazy. Do you think, like, say, the uh, the electrical grid or the uh, EMF waves or any of that stuff, do you think that affects us Spirit, yes, I guess can. spiritually and physically and mentally? Energetically, it can affect us. And then whatever thoughts we get from that emotional effect it has on us or whatever thoughts we, uh, how do I say, construct – uh, will affect us uh, emotionally and then we'll further think about how that feeling is and create a whole notion about it and then we're affected spiritually. <laughs> so everything does have its effect on us, but understand that these are energy. This is energy. This is vibration. It's not separate from what will you, what I would say we consider to be us. It's not separate. We just have to adjust our views or we just have to stay relaxed, mindful, in the now, without thinking there is a now or a past or future. Just simply do what you are to do, and that's all you do. Anything outside of that is not what you should do. Simple. Unless you're driving a car, you better pay attention to that, to that car and the mirrors and do things mechanically, you do it. You focus on what you're doing. You know? I guess uh, I'm sort of thinking like in terms of, um, say you're a musician, for instance, right? If you play your instrument in an area that has good acoustics, it your music sort of sounds better, so to speak. Um, but then again, I guess the other side of that coin would be a you know a master musician can make his instrument sound beautiful no matter where he is. <laughs> of course, there's favorable conditions for everything. <laughs> you know, most people don't want to live near a train station. Some people have no choice but to live near a train station because they made themselves not have the choice to move. So uh, the electrical uh, field of that train station can cause havoc on the body and perhaps cause cancer too. I mean, I've known, I've known uh, people who have had become very sick because they lived near a train station for many, many, many years. Con conversely too, other people live by a train station and essentially learn to tune it out. Well, sure. My school was uh, above a train station. And at times I would uh, stay in there as well uh, overnight. And um, how I do it was that the train comes, then the train goes. <laughs> and I just go to sleep. <laughs> you know, it's just the sounds. And through meditation, you learn to take things in. When you take things in, your attention is not going away from you. It's not being scattered. So everything goes, it concentrates into one place. So all the sounds go inward. Your hearing is turned inside. And you become more empowered that way. So unplugged is that when you are, <clears throat> excuse me, reflecting inside, you are recognizing your emotional habits, your thinking habits, your mental habits, and your body habits, what is pleasurable, and what are the things that you like to do with your body, or whether it's running, walking, sitting, lying, uh, lying on a couch, or whatever the case is. Okay. All right. And Time then we for, go deeper. Time for a curveball. Uh-oh. If somebody, 
if somebody was like blind and deaf, would they, do you think it would be easier for them to achieve meditation? <laughs> Whoa. Uh, it's hard to say. And why do I say hard to say? It's only simple because you have to see what's in their mind. What are, they, what are the views about themselves that they hold because they're uh, blind and deaf? What are those views? That's all. It really comes out to what's in the person's mind and what they, attain, what, what they uh, in, uh, entertain with themselves. Okay? Yeah, I, now, I they guess. They have an advantage because they don't have the eye karma in the sense of the energy moving outward, but they, they are blinded, so they have a heavy karma of the eyes. And then they are deaf, so they have heavy karma of the ears. So now they have to try to get that energy to put somewhere else. That goes down to what views they hold about themselves. And I guess too, like you know, maybe they would, uh, maybe they would be moved by touches and smells like more so than other people because of that. I guess so. Yeah. Well, because <clears throat> the uh, the hearing faculty and the sight faculty are obstructed, and so now that energy has to go somewhere else. Right. Right. That's all. Now, how do they cultivate? Really depends. So I'm not going to say anything else because then what happens is people say, I'm going to go blind so I can attain a light. <laughs> no. <laughs> or I'm going to poke a hole in my ear and, you know, go deaf so I can attain enlightenment. No, it doesn't work that way. It's really up to the person's mind. Are they able to sit? Are they able to concentrate? Are they able to break through their attachments of their thoughts? If they're not, they're not getting anywhere. Yeah, again, I think... Um... If somebody were to pluck their eyes out or, you know, poke holes in their ears, that's that's essentially the same thing as saying, um, you know, I can't find it unless I'm on the the mountains of Tibet, right? You're just trying, you're setting these conditions for, for yeah. enlightenment or whatever, right? So, I mean, people don't need to go traveling anywhere unless they really feel, <clears throat> excuse me, such an urge to be in those places, then just go. But truthfully, we can do all of it right in our bedroom or right in our living room. Or make up your own place in your house for cultivation. And it's not just a few minutes a day. You try to be like this all the time. You try to uh, check what's going on in your mind. And you try to change. Making new habits. Making that energy that you had for something go somewhere else. And that habit should be wholesome to influence and empower uh, the habit of looking inward and the habit of attaining your enlightenment. <laughs> Planting new seeds, you know, you plant seeds in the, in the ground and you get a fruit. Our cultivation is just that. So when it's unplugged, like again, I'm referring to the title of this because it's, it's, it's really a, a deceptive like idea. Yeah. <laughs> it's just that we are jumping away or transcending or going away from our usual ideas of how we live and recognizing how they have been uh, created and then our attachments to it, why we use those things. And then we change them. And when we change them in our thought and we change them in our body, and we change it in our speech, we start creating a new habit energy. That habit energy influences the body. It influences our cells and influences our nerves. And then we create nerves that uh, are formed around that kind of habit energy. Okay, so really we're looking at the mind ground in the sense of our body being this field of senses that are formed from our thoughts and formed from our habits because of those thoughts. And then we have the certain type of receptors to accept those things. And when we don't have it, we go into withdrawal. Okay, people who believe having sex and having that gratification is the pinnacle of human existence will stop at nothing to have that. And when they don't, they just sit there going crazy, figuring out when they're going to get it. So could we say that being unplugged is sort of a metaphor for... I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but not having outflows, or would it be more like not, <laughs> not having inflows, or I guess? <laughs> That's more uh, needing further explanation. Uh, without having outflows, we're not moved by the things around us. 
We're not letting our, our sight be thrown and grasping at the things around us. We're not falling into a, a whirlwind of craziness and tornadoes in our emotions and in our mind. So yeah, unplug this, just that metaphor that just says, get out of our head and stop believing in what we think and start investigating what we think. Is it real? Where do we get it from? We find ourselves living other people's ideas. So if there's outflows, doesn't that necessarily mean that there must also be inflows? Well, when you cut out one, the other is gone. <laughs> yeah, okay. There is no inflow and there is no truthfully, there is no outside and there is no inside. But because we, uh, we perceive and assume by our thinking that there is something to gain, then there is something our energy goes to. And thus we create a habit of that. And that's where our energy goes. It goes down to our intention. It goes into how we react. It goes into what we do with it. So the whole interplay of our bodies' actions, our mind's actions, and our speeches, <clears throat> our speech action, like how we do with our mouth, how we do with our body, and how we do with our thoughts. These three things are key uh, when it comes down to our cultivation. We have to get a hold of that. That which is unwholesome and causes damage to our body, we should not partake in. That which drains our energy out, uh, energy out from our senses, six senses, uh, from our body, we should not partake in. And it's hard because so many things we built views about being so good for us are actually some most of the things that are not very good. And why they are not very good? Because even though not everyone wants to be a Buddha, or not everyone wants to have some wisdom, and not everyone believes in this method, you know, but it's not good for us because it takes us away from that way. <laughs> it takes our energy away from fulfilling the idea or fulfilling the goal or fulfilling our, uh, not even fulfilling, I should just change that word. It's more about seeing what is actually there for us. Okay, here's kind of another odd question. Uh, cultivators generally look at outflows as a negative thing. Um, is there a situation where an outflow can be a positive thing? And I guess I know it's probably going to come down to views, but I'll, I'll let you explain it better. <laughs> well, no, there is no good out of outflows because when we talk about outflows, it's more about our senses, our six senses, okay? And where that energy goes and the, vo the ideas we hold about those things, okay? So people seeing a pretty woman in the street wow, she's really something. What says that she's really something? The mass majority of people? Us? Where do we get the notion that that is actually the right thing? So we put, or actually that way. So we put our ideas and we put our habits into this direction and our energy goes there. And everything associated with that kind of grasping manifests in our body and in our mind and in our actions. Same thing with hearing. Same thing with food that we taste. Whatever we feel is, uh, we taste is uh, delightful, we'll go for more. Whatever we like that is uh, good in, in, in uh, sound, we'll go for that more. Whatever we like to touch because it's soft, we'll go for that. Okay? And how we like to feel with our body, we'll go for that too. And whatever things we like to think about and imagine all the time, we'll go for that. Those things take our energy away. They scatter us. We want to bring all that energy in because... So it says, what good is that? Well, they never tried. And no matter how much I'll say how good it is for you, it doesn't matter. What matters is that if no one's ever done that, or people have not tried to do that and really applied themselves to doing it, they will never know what it truly is about. So they cannot say oh, it's useless or it's stupid or this and that. Well, everyone's have, everyone has given in to their senses and look where the world is today. Why don't we try to go in and see what the world is like there? Can you explain it in like three sentences? <laughs> <laughs> no. All right. <laughs> well, what the world is like inside? No. No, no, no. <clears throat> How to, uh, what it's like How not to do this? Yeah, I guess the, the state of mindfulness or the state of uh, meditation. Well, look at it this way. 
meditation. What is when what is meditating? They are no longer in the process of stilling their thoughts. They already have got that. When one is practicing meditation, they are in the manner, they are in the process of focusing on one specific thing so their thoughts eventually slow down and stop. Once that happens, they enter the actual meditating. Okay, now, what is it like to not have outflows? Wow, that's pretty deep. You know, <laughs> I need someone to certify me on that if I have ever, you know, if I attained that. But no, I haven't attained no outflows whatsoever because I'm not a Buddha, you know. But, so what, uh, what, what about when you're meditating and you, you look at your, say you start at uh, 10 in the morning and you think five minutes past and all of a sudden it's 11 in the morning. You've just been absorbed really well in your meditation. <laughs> You've really gotten to a state where... Your breath had turned inward, your thoughts have stopped, and now your internal breathing goes. And, you know, like the saying goes, sky above, the earth below, it doesn't exist. But mm -hmm. I give people an idea, like not outflows, is more of a stream, a stream of water that is neither running or neither water. Okay. Is this a Zen? <laughs> is this a Zen riddle? <laughs> I have no clue, but that's the best I can explain it as, because you're not making a, you're not giving it shape. You're not giving what is totally around us, around and in, a shape. It is just that way, but we'll see it manifest as a certain way. But in truth, it is not that way. And if we see it as that way, we have taken our energy to discrimination and we have put it out that this is the way it is. So that is outflow. But if we don't, it stays the way it is, but we're not creating notions about it. So that energy stays within us or in the sense of uh, within the body, it doesn't drain away from us. We don't have to create more false thinking. We don't have to do any more toiling. We just are thus. But pre really, the more one is explained, the more one tries to explain it, it's not going to do anybody any good. Cultivate. Do it. Get the work done. And then start talking about it. But talk about it where and when it's necessary. Not just, you know, let people get an idea. Oh, maybe, oh, this tastes like strawberries. Oh, strawberry tastes sweet and this and that. Okay, good. Then I know what it tastes like. No. You can intellectualize the out no outflow state, but truthfully... Getting it is totally not what we intellectualize. That's why there's mm -hmm. two ways. You can assume intellectualizing, oh, I understand what Lao Tzu is talking about. I understand what the Buddha is saying. I understand what Zhuang Tzu is saying. I understand what Confucius is saying. Oh, I get it. All right. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty close to being a sage. I pretty, I pretty much understand exactly what they're saying. Okay, good. Where's the practice? Someone slaps you in the face. Are you going to sit there with a, you know, with a chain whip and try to cut their head off? No. Why did you have the conditions in the first place to let someone feel that they could actually slap you in the face? So you're not a sage. And if you are and that happens, where's your teaching that allows them to wake up? And if that doesn't happen, why you allow yourself to be in such a place? I mean, we have to ask. We can assume we understand all these principles but there's no practice behind us because we still get taken for greed. We still get taken by praise. We still get taken by jealousy. We still get taken by desire. Okay. We still get taken by when we fail. We still get taken by fame. We get taken by these things. That means we enjoy it or we get entertained by it or we feel good somehow, some way. We know we feel something delightful or something painful that we didn't get it. We don't have that practice. We have to practice. So we must do the toiling. We must do the inner reflection in order to recognize why we do the things we do, why we say and think the things we say and think. And then try to realize they're not ours. And once we get out of that, that's unplugged. When you mm. get out of our own notions of what we, what I'll tell you, what people have empowered in us, what we have accepted and empowered, okay, when we get out of that world, 
then we can actually understand what is actually a true world. Get out of our senses. Get out of our views. Take a vacation. Oh, I'm going to ask you a real annoying question. Going back, <laughs> going back to the opening of the show. <laughs> what, you mean these amazing. questions aren't annoying already. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, going back to the start, you said you know we're not talking about the Matrix, but let's talk about the Matrix for a minute. <laughs> Do you think that that's sort of a metaphor for what we're talking about? <laughs> Wait, let me see. If we go into Google and we Google search all the metaphors for the Matrix <laughs> movie, I'm sure we can find one that we all like. <laughs> Uh, I, I wasn't referring to a Matrix movie at all in this, but it kind of sounded like it because of the name, Unplugged. Right. Uh, but okay, um, the world around us is not the true world. Uh, we're just uh, living in there and being the, uh, taken by our senses. What we like, we'll, we'll have, and uh, pretty much like the movie of the Matrix. Then we get out of it, and it's like holy, sh holy crap! The world is gone to shit. The true world is like all broken, and we live in the ground. We are mold people. Right, <laughs> you know, and then you get plugged back in, and then you can fly and do all this fun stuff. Uh, what I'm saying is that if we can, if we, if we apply ourselves, apply the mind, and we get out of all what we assume the world is, because we have to accept the fact that we have a view of the world. Now, what if we don't have that view anymore? What is the world then? People would say, "Well, I'm." Make up another view and put it. No, the point is not to make any more views. See the world without your views. What is it? Does it even exist anymore? Right? Let's do that first. After that, what can we do? Or better yet, what can we not do? Okay? There's nothing we cannot do at that point. But we have to do that. And the more practice, the more energy, the more vibration, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, that the more higher of a vibration we will be at and things change in the body do you believe i was having this conversation with my middle school students we were talking about how the brain how the body uh can actually help heal the body when it's sick and i went further and i said how about the mind and they pointed to the brain i said wrong do you even know where the mind is they said it's in the brain right that's where we think i was like no the, and i'm going to explain what the brain does i was like but that's not the mind is it now and they don't know it's like, well, the if you can in, do this. The mind's in the liver. Everybody knows that. <laughs> well, for the men, it's in the groin, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sadly, in many cases, yeah. <clears throat> so that's where we just, the guys put, well, many can put most of their focus and energy there. And that's that's it. But one kid left the classroom after I went back to my, uh, my department, my room, my office. And he was talking to me about it. And they kept bringing up the movie Lucy. Where, you know, using the mind and all that stuff and the brains, uh, uh, different centers of the brain can do all these things. Certain percentages of the brain are being used, and many aren't. So if we're talking about that, I said, well, instead of thinking just the physical aspect and even the energetic aspect of it all, what if you take both of them and you don't separate them at all? It would see that one relies on the other. And that one other is better or more important than the other. Now, what if we throw in a certain type of method of thought? Because thought will be like the electrical charge for the brain, let's say, or for the, everything else. If we throw in elect this electrical charge and that thing can nourish or help us, uh, help the energy of the body uh, go faster. Okay, how about that? Or even slow down. How about that? He goes, that's pretty cool. I was like, imagine it could be that way. He goes, how do we do that? <laughs> I said, how about you learn how to meditate? Because if you can't know where your mind is, or if you even just can't cultivate or can't concentrate, how are you ever going to even get close to that? He says, meditation will do it. I said, damn it. <laughs> if it doesn't do that, that everything we've ever been taught by all the ancient masters and all these old societies, spiritual societies, and even current society is all a lie. They said, you don't have to believe any of them. But just think about it. If science is telling us stuff that we were talking, well, sages were talking about a thousand years ago, a thousand years ago, and they're confirming some things to be true. They haven't confirmed anything else to be false, but they just confirmed certain things to be true. 
how the hell is that possible? How are these people able to realize that back then without machines? So our machines are more of a hindrance than they are of uh, support. He just is like, whoa. <laughs> so he said, whoa. He goes, good, good. I got to come to, I got to come here and meditate more. <laughs> so, I mean, it's more of that. And, and reflect inside and understand and then let go. And then you can see the world. That's unplugged. That's what it needs. That's really see the world. All right. Why don't we uh, Why don't we end on that note, Lynn? Okay. All right. And uh, I will read one of my famous, wonderful, inspirational quotes that often don't have anything to do with what we're talking about. But <laughs> <laughs> oh no! All right. So let's see if you can guess who said this. What lies oh. behind you and what lies in front of you pales in comparison to what lies inside of you. The Buddha. No, Ralph Waldo Emerson. <laughs> well, I did say the Buddha, right? But <laughs> <laughs> every time you say the Buddha, so <laughs> half the time you're probably going to be right. But it's, it's it's always a good guess. No, the last time, the the only one time I didn't use, I didn't say the Buddha. It was the Buddha. <laughs> <It> was... <laughs> every other time, eh, wrong. You know, Arnold Schwarzenegger, eh, right? You know, no, it was Papa Smurf. Oh man, I thought it was the Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> it was Gargamel. Oh man, that was a Buddha. It was Leonardo, the Ninja Turtle. Oh damn it! <laughs> All right. Oh, well, thanks again for joining us, Lynn. Fun. And uh, thanks, thanks everybody for listening. And be sure to join us next week as we discuss mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bye.